and uh, the header in the office says conservation connections. Um, so you may not see value stewardship on the overhead, but on the door you'll see it. Um, come in any time, the door is open, come in and say hi. Come in and say hi to the folks at um, Prairie Enthusiasts as well. Um, you're welcome to come in. Um, say hello. We are a small conservation nonprofit. Um, that we mostly are focused on the water, water issues, water challenges, watersheds. Uh, we do a lot of work for the community. We do a lot of education and outreach. We work quite a bit with private landowners, uh, farmers as well, uh, trying to um, adopt conservation measures or whatever people might want. Any way that we can grease the wheels to make it easier for people to adopt conservation into their lives or take a more active part in conservation. That's kind of one of our main themes in our work. Um, but come, out, come find more out about us. Um, on the way out, if you didn't get in on the way in, there's um, a couple of our newsletters on the table. There's infor information about memberships. Um, you are welcome to become a member at any time during the year. We don't have a formal membership drive. Uh, membership is pretty affordable. Um, there are a few perks, um, but it's mostly about intrinsic motivation, I think. So um, a couple newsletters a year and, and a feel good, and you get to know what we're doing out in the field and, and help us with our work. It's fantastic. Um, we, about half of our annual budget and revenue is based on membership. Um, the other half is typically grant or grant funded. Um, so as a result of that, our funding from year to year kind of fluctuates. Um, and one of the things that keeps us from fluctuating too much, um, because that's how grant funding typically works, is a solid membership base. Um, so we really appreciate if people who were members, would like to be members, uh, come on out and uh, come find us, find us on our website, find us here tonight, um, stop by the office and get more information about that. Um, we also, Conservation on Tap, this is a free event. If you want to leave a donation, that's fantastic. We really appreciate it. It helps, it helps support the hours that go into this event. We don't have a lot of overhead for this event, again, because you know places like uh, people here at Ruby Spoon, Mike and Andy Lynn, donate the space. Most of the speakers, uh, don't ask for any stipend or sometimes we get a stipend for travel or whatnot, but they, we're not paying, typically we're not paying them directly. Our overhead is pretty low, but the most expenses come to through staff time, development of the program, reaching out, trying to line people up for the year, that kind of thing. That's, those are the hours that go into, those are the costs associated with this event. So if, you have it, if you're willing to offset a little bit of that for us, thank you. We appreciate it. Um, and I think that's it. Any VSN staff or board members have anything to say that I missed? Thanks, guys. So without much further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Peter. You ready to go, Peter? Okay. And then he'll jump in and take it from there. Um, we'll take a break about halfway through. Um, give you a chance to use the bathrooms if you're not, not familiar with they, where, where they are. They're back through the public market. Go through the back double French doors in the back here and kind of walk, wind your way through and the bathrooms are on the far side. Um, you can get a, another drink if you want at that point, but feel free to get up and down as, as you like. Um, and all right. So. I'm going to read your bio for you, Peter, and keep it straight. I'm sorry, I don't have it memorized. Okay. Now, Peter Allen is an ecologist turned farmer who runs Mastodon, Mastodon Valley Farm, a 220-acre regener regenerative farm near Viola. Using the historic oak savanna as a model, Peter has planted over 10,000 fruit and nut, fruit and nut trees and shrubs, converted over 40 acres of cropland into native tall grass prairie, and rotationally grazed herds of cattle, sheep, goats, and hogs. And, and poultry across their steep wooded hillsides, ridge top fields, and lush valley pastures. Peter also builds timber frame buildings from the valley's trees and lives in their off grid timber frame homestead with his wife Maureen, who's here tonight, um, and their two kids. So a warm welcome to Peter. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. I'm Peter Allen. This is one of my favorite pictures because it's kind of got everything in it. You got a big bur oak tree uh, down by the trout stream, and then you got cows doing this really magical thing that cows do really well, which is turn grass into milk. <laughs> I can't think of anything more magical and uh, life giving than that, so I appreciate cows for that. Um, we've been in the Driftless area here farming since 2012. Uh, and before that, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison for about 10 years uh, studying ecology and teaching uh, and uh, complex systems theory. So how do we think about complex systems and ecosystems are obviously complex systems. And so how can we sort of learn 
take what we what's been developed in other realms of study, like um, informatics and uh, energy theory, and apply that towards ecology uh, and managing ecosystems. And so I did that for about 10 years. And I'll tell you what: anybody that wants to start a farm, I wouldn't recommend graduate school as a good way to prepare. <laughs> But that was my path, that's what I did. Uh, I don't necessarily regret it, but I didn't get any skills. Uh, so I kind of start from scratch. So anyway, um, the first half of this talk is going to be kind of an overview of what I learned when I was in school and kind of uh, the ideas that I developed that resulted in the kind of farm that we run today. Uh, and then the second half is going to be about the farm itself and, and the things that we're doing here. So uh, I like to start these kind of talks on a, on a real light note. So what did I learn in school? All of our prosperity is derived at the expense of our planet's ecosystems. Uh, agriculture is the number one driver of global ecosystem destruction. And we're so disconnected from nature as human beings on planet Earth today that we're not even realizing how the extent that we have to destroy nature in order to just to eat and breathe and do the things that we do from day to day. And so you guys know all this stuff, so I don't need to tell you, but this is kind of the context. Do you take questions from your sure. folks in your after only? We can. Are you sure you compared that number to with uh, the industrial military complex? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can separate them. It's a trap. I think they Right, it's difficult yeah. to separate them. Uh, and that's... The greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is more. <laughs> yes. And I'm talking about global ecosystem destruction. So that is taking land that would otherwise have animals, plants, fungus in the soil, uh, vines growing up all over the things. Ecology, we destroy ecology in order to eat, and then we plant monoculture crop fields. And we've done that all over the planet, and there's massive uh, bad things that are a result of that. And I don't want to get into that, because most of you probably know most of it, and that's not going to help us by just harping on the bad things. I want to talk about the good things. But this is an important context to, to what we're going to talk about. So what I believe personally is that we have to restore diverse, resilient, functioning, and productive ecosystems as a foundation for any kind of sustainable and dignified prosperity. So right now we are a prosperous civilization, but it's built on a foundation of destruction. So what my... Uh, uh, philosophy is is that we have to build a new foundation and that foundation has to be built upon functional ecosystems so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by a functional ecosystem they're diverse they're resilient they're productive landscapes with trophic structure and this is really important so all that means is that you've got sunlight coming down and plants growing photosynthesizing trophic structure means that there's herbivores eating the plants and that there's predators eating the herbivores. And so that sunlight is transformed through ecosystems up the food chain. Because a lot of our ecosystems and natural areas, since the megafauna went extinct, we don't have much trophic structure anymore. We have white-tailed deer and turkey right now. And that's like the majority of the biomass in like natural areas, and that's not healthy from an ecosystem perspective, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, regulated by keystone species. And we're going to talk more about that going forward. Um, one of my heroes here, Aldo Leopold, uh, he was the first director. He, it was his vision that created the uh, UW Arboretum, about 1,500 acres right in the middle of the city of Madison. Uh, and at the inauguration, he said the hill on which we stand was in an oak opening. Our grandparents described sometimes with rapture the beauty of these open, orchard-like stands of oaks interspersed with copses of shrubs and a profusion of prairie grasses and flowers that grew between them. So he's describing the way the upper Midwest, much of, the, much of our continent actually, but especially in the upper Midwest, especially in Wisconsin, and especially in the Driftless area, we are in the heart of the historic Oak Savannah Range. Uh, and he speaks eloquently about what that kind of looked like. Uh, and they ranged all over our planet, uh, and all over our continent, specifically uh, the Oak Savannah. Um, George Rogers Clark and his campaign to take the Northwestern Territories from the British, where we are right now, uh, as he was going across Illinois, he stated that it was as beautiful, more beautiful than he could imagine. Extending beyond the side are large prairies covered with buffalo and other game, varied by groves of the trees that appear like islands in a sea. So you can kind of get a visual of what these savannas would have looked like pre-settlement. Um, 
Today, savannas are the most endangered ecosystem in North America, less than 2% remain. I would even argue it's probably even less than that. Um, anywhere, savannas built really fertile soil. And we're going to talk about the mechanisms of how they built that soil a little bit later, but one of the results of having a savanna in a place is they build really, really deep, rich topsoil. Prairies do the same thing. Uh, and so a lot of it got turned over to agriculture. Uh, anywhere that was not suitable for agriculture, like on a steep hillside, those were often kept savannas for a long time in the driftless area. The old timers grazed sheep on the hillsides. That kept it open. You can still see some of the open grown uh, oak trees around. But after World War II, the price of wool dropped. Nobody, most people got rid of their grazing animals as they switched to industrial crop farming. And now much of our oak savannas have converted into uh, a mesic forest. They've uh, afforestation. They're, they're turning into forest uh, instead of a savanna. <coughs> This is just kind of an example. Leopold was really into restoration. He, his, he created the first prairie restoration uh, in the world at the Curtis Prairie in uh, the Arboretum. Uh, and he said, it's important to the future welfare of our state to know what it was like before we took away from the Indians. He said the, the Arboretum should serve as a sample of old Wisconsin as a starting point in the long and laborious job of building a permanent and mutually beneficial relationship between civilized men and the civilized landscape. So how many people have been to the Arboretum in Madison? Do you recall any savannas sticking out in your mind? So where is the savanna? It's a big place, and you go there, there's actually places that are historic savannas that they went and planted sugar maples underneath the oak trees. They wanted to speed up succession. <laughs> anyway, this is just an example of a, of a broader trend, especially in the conservation movement of the the, the distinction between letting something go back to nature and preserving it, and then actually wanting to restore the way it was before. And most people don't make that distinction. They assume that one means the other, and that's not necessarily true. Um, here's a graph from Wikipedia of, of ecological succession. So we start with bare ground. Maybe a volcano came and, and wiped out an ecosystem or a forest and started bare ground. First you get mosses that come in, and then that creates a substrate where grass seeds can grow. You get a little bit of a grassland, and then your woody perennials start growing. Uh, and anybody that's ever watched in our area an old field that's taken out of crop production knows that it doesn't take too long before it goes from grass to shrubs to fast-growing trees like box elder and autumn olive, and then before you know it, you got a little bit of a, of a forest going on there. So in our area, it can, it can be as quick as 25, 30 years to go from no canopy cover to 100% canopy cover of woody, of woody perennial species. So that's, that's the standard model of succession and ecology, how ecosystems uh, change through time. Where's the savanna? Well, you got, we got these reports of Europeans showing up in the mid, Midwest saying all they can see is, for, as far as they can see, is, is oak savannas. Scattered oak, hickory, and walnut trees with prairie grass in between and lots of animals eating it. So it's not even represented in our most basic understanding of ecology. The savanna doesn't even have a, have a role in here. Um, so why is that? Uh, John Curtis took over the, your, the arboretum from, uh, from Leopold, and, and my, my office uh, at UW was actually in Curtis's lab, old laboratory, which he was a pretty amazing guy. But when they started working in the 50s, uh, they, they changed the vision from Leopold, and their new vision was a demonstration research area where native plants, animals, and landscapes can be studied under natural or nearly natural conditions. That's a little bit different from understanding what it was like before we took it away from the Indians. Those aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, oak trees, as many people probably know, aren't regenerating like they used to. They're the foundation of uh, wildlife populations are the foundation, they're keystone species of the, of the eastern hardwood forest, and they're now regenerating. There's a lot of reasons why overpopulation of deer is one reason, uh, not the best logging practices is another reason, but there's a lot of reasons, and it's been a concern of scientists for a really long time. So in 95, a big consortium of scientists from all over the eastern United States got together. They spent weeks together uh, hashing this out, and they put together a plan, a recovery plan for oaks. So I found this in our botany library, got really excited, opened it up, started flipping through it. On the first, in the executive summary, it says the re what they're trying to accomplish here is the restoration of all natural ecosystem functions and processes, including a natural range of biotic community types, 
and conditions in which natural selection can operate. It doesn't sound too dissimilar from here. They want landscapes that can be studied under natural or nearly natural conditions. What's the key word in both of these phrases that they keep using over and over? Natural. natural. So what gives with the word natural? We have this thing that's deeply seated in our psyche as Americans about the way North America was before Europeans got here. We have this, even if we don't necessarily believe it, 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 it penetrates the way we think about the world pretty deeply. And you can see that in just the way they talk about the Arboretum and the way they talk about science and the way they talk about nature. But we have this myth that the United States was wild in the wilderness before we got here. Yeah, there were some Native Americans, but they were hunters and gatherers. They were just running around, eating fruits and nuts off the forest floor. They weren't really fundamentally changing anything. So what I want to talk about now is the great, to the great extent to which Native Americans were fundamentally changing everything. So we talk about what a keystone species is, is one that has disproportionate effects on the structure and function of the ecosystem that it lives in. Right? That's a keystone species. Oak trees are a keystone species in eastern forest. Uh, Native Americans, it's very, it's really not actually difficult to make this argument, I'll make it in just about four slides, were the ultimate keystone species that shaped the ecosystems across North America, I mean, without, without an exception. Um, there were three main ways that they interacted with ecosystems that had massive large-scale effects. The biggest and, and most frequently used is fire, and we're not talking canopy crown, wildfires like they're having in Australia right now, we're talking about controlled burns, ground fires, burning off ungrazed and unmanaged vegetation, whether it's tall grass of the prairie uh, after it's senesced and gone to seed and turned brown and is no longer photosynthesizing, or some shrubby undergrowth <coughs> under smoke trees. Um, they use fire for many, many reasons. There's hundreds of documented reasons that uh, archaeologists and anthropologists have documented for why they use fire, just a few of them, because we don't normally think about these things. But these people, they're, one of their staple crops was acorns and hickory nuts. So you think about, okay, well, if I'm going to feed my family acorns, i got to go harvest under oak trees. Well, think about what grows under oak trees in a savanna, tall grasses and shrubs. So when the acorns fall in the fall, and you've got tall grasses and shrubs everywhere, is it going to be easy to harvest acorns? Of course not. So a week or two before harvest, you go out and set a little fire, and you burn the area under your oak trees, because by that time the tall the, the, the native prairie grasses are, are, are brown and ready to burn. Now you've got a nice easy area to get your uh, pick your acorns off the ground. You can see them and pick them up easy. The other thing is is that there's a lot of worms that eat acorns and hickory nuts and walnuts. And a fire kills those worms in the soil. And so now you've got a little more time and even if it's a little wet, you're, you have a little more odds of getting more of a harvest. So that's one reason. Um, they use hazelnut stems for uh, arrows, for their, for their bows and arrows. If you burn a hazelnut shrub in the spring, that first year growth in the summer is straighter and less curvy than otherwise, if it hadn't burned. Um, and then burning, when you burn uh, a dead grass, the grass that grows behind it, you leave a bunch of minerals when you burn, uh, the, the grass that grows behind it is super nutritious and high in protein which is highly desirable for animals, for grazing animals, and bison are known to selectively seek out the places that were most recently grazed when they're on their migrations and their, and their, and their routes. So Native Americans, you know, I'm out there moving polywire around, electric fence to, to move my animals around, but I could be using fire over a broad uh, uh, landscape to move animals around too. Uh, they hunted a lot. White-tailed deer was a staple. Uh, and they would hunt pretty significantly. So there's you know, a lot of romanticism about Native Americans, and they were ecologists and conservationists, and, and you can make that argument, but it looks like they were actually pretty hard on the deer, and they would overhunt them pretty radically. Now, the difference between them and us is that they only lived in the village for about seven <coughs> years. So they would overhunt an area extremely hard, wipe out the local deer population, then they move somewhere else. And then that deer population recovers. So at a small scale, it looks like they're massively overhunting. At a large scale, they actually maintain a very stable meta population because they're moving. It's like rotational grazing. When I bring my cows into a new paddock, we eat all the grass down, but then we leave and let it rest for a month. And then everything grows back. So um, they were letting, 
areas rest by moving their villages. But by hunting that much, you're going to have large effects on the vegetation that grows in response. So you're changing the ecology of the land by hunting uh, uh, in, this, in this way. And the other one we don't often think about is horticulture. There's a, lot, there's a lot of evidence that people were moving genetics around, planting things specifically for uh, certain traits that they found valuable. Um, there's a, an ecologist back in the 30s found a little village outside of Green Bay. You know, it's, it's maple basswood forest for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And in the middle of this maple forest, they find this little grove of, there's like some white oaks and some plum trees and some uh, apples, uh, some crab apples. And they're like, where did these genetics come from? There's none of these species for hundreds of miles. And then they start digging around and it turned out to be a little Native American villages, village where those trees were planted. If you've ever been like up in the boundary waters, way up in northern forests, you'll find like bur oaks and crab apples up there, blueberries on the sides of lakes that, you know, they're, they're hundreds and hundreds of miles away from home. Uh, wild rice is their native range is up in the uh, boundary waters and up in the north woods, but there was when when Europeans got here, there was wild rice as far south as Madison and the lakes around Madison. That's way outside of their, their historic range. So people were moving plants around. Um, uh, and, and there's even some evidence of, of, of tree uh, collect, seed collection from, about, from uh, desirable tree species or individual trees and moving them around. Uh, uh, especially, there's more evidence of new. We don't have a lot of evidence of things like this because you know you can imagine there's not a lot of material that would be left around, but there is some evidence of that. Um, so you, you add all this up, and, and what that means is that North America, because so many people lived here for so long, that they completely changed the ecology of North America to what it would have been were they not here. Which means that it wasn't a wilderness. In no sense was North America anything approaching a wilderness. In fact, you could make the argument that they were, the, their ecological actions were done in a way specifically to help, the, to help uh, maintain the ecosystems that produced the most food of any configuration of plants and animals. Because oak savannas, because you have grassland and trees, you've got your fruits and nuts from the trees and the herbivory uh, and all the biomass, the, the elk and the bison uh, and white-tailed deer, is, and way higher numbers than would be in a, in a forest if this were a, uh, a, a more natural a more natural system. There's way more food. So the Europeans came here and they didn't see straight fences and plows behind horses, so they just assumed it was unused wilderness, and it turns out that it was actually a highly managed landscape to produce abundant food for people, which, what's your definition of agriculture? So there are savannas all over the world, are they all managed, and they're all managed in this way, or is there like natural savannas? Like there are more natural savannas. Like wildfire managed? Yeah, so more fire prone areas. Uh, you know, if you if you go down to like southern Africa, you know, they they still have a lot of animals down there that have all been extinct here, and so they are more active in managing that landscape. And that's what I'm going to get into uh, next. So, what was this like before people got here? So we know that humans were here for at least ten or twelve thousand years uh, prior to us showing up. What was the landscape like prior to people being here? Well, it turns out it was a savanna. Go figure for millions and millions of years. Now, just as kind of a disclaimer, I'm saying that we're talking millions of years. Ice ages happen, right? Forests move back and forth. So it wasn't like it was one thing for millions of years. It was lots of different things. But if you look at it all, it was shifting grasslands, forests, open areas. But open is key because all the animals that we know were here couldn't have, wouldn't have been here if this was a closed canopy forest for miles around. There wouldn't be any food for them. <coughs> These are grazing animals and browsing animals, uh, and there were a lot of them. Uh, you know, we had giraffes and uh, giant elk, giant bison that make our bison today look puny, uh, giant 
beavers. You know, you look driving along in Kickapoo and see a, it's like, whoa, look at that like oak tree that a beaver's gone after. Like, that's, a, that's an ambitious beaver. Now imagine a beaver that's five times the size. It's like, okay, it can do some damage. And then the elephant is, and, and our native one here would have been the mastodon, which was a browsing animal. So they ate shrubs and trees. They stripped the leaves off of trees. So now imagine your favorite driftless valley. You can just imagine in your head with grasses and some tall, open-grown trees. Now imagine a herd of 40 mastodons walking through that valley. Now imagine you've got a, a, a big cop, so if you've got poplar trees, and you've got willow trees, and you've got box elder trees, what's going to happen when 40 mastodons show up? Well, they eat trees. Has anybody ever seen a cow rub their butt on a fence post? Anyone? Have you ever seen a knock something over by rubbing it? Okay? Cows do that all the time. They love rubbing their butts on things, especially small trees, and especially fence posts. I just try to imagine what a full-grown mastodon would do rubbing on a tree. So they would knock trees over on purpose just to be able to strip all the leaves off the branches. So when I'm out with a chainsaw, I'm thinking of myself as a mastodon. <laughs> and as a former, well, you know, in the environmental community, we, you know, cutting trees is bad. And certainly, some, cutting some trees are bad, and, and you don't want to cut all the trees for sure, but just thinking about what it would have been like with all these animals here for millions of years. Like, what are the trees expecting? Are they expecting to be left alone? Just an interesting thing to think about. Look at that short-faced bear. This thing for months. It's run like 50 miles an hour. Okay, so for 20 million years, we had mastodons here. And bigger things, like the giant ground sloth, that could reach way up. This was another browser eating tree leaves. Um, the result of that over millions of years is that you don't have close canopy forests because these guys come in and stomp them down if they get started. They strip the leaves off and what that happens is that opens it up. And what happens when, the, when you open the ground up to sunlight under the canopy of trees is grasses grow up. Well, once grasses grow up, that attracts grazing animals. And we had tons of grazing animals, the camels, the horses, the bison, the elk. Animals that ate a lot of grass would come in and that would help maintain open. So you've got these shifting uh, mosaics of vegetation with the primary pattern being that it was maintained open by these huge animals. Um, and just think about how, how much damage it did to our ecologies when these guys went extinct. I mean, this is what all of our plants evolved with for millions and millions of years, and now, and now they're gone. So what happened when the first animals, which were horses, were the first animals to, that evolved the ability to eat grass? Okay? So grass first evolved right before the end of the dinosaurs. So they were coming up, but they were not, there was no such thing as a grassland. There were just these tiny little plants that were growing in the shade of the big... Uh, palm trees and, and, and the big conifers that the dinosaurs were eating. After the dinosaurs, you know, we, the, the mammals take over the world, but it wasn't until about 19 million years ago, about, well, 30 million years ago is when uh, the low crowned molars evolved in the, in the first horses, which allowed them to chew up grass. Grass does not have very much nutrition in it relative to a lot of other leaves. And so you really have to grind it to get any kind of sugar out of it. And so it, it took special molars for the, the horses to develop in order to allow them to do it. And then once they did that, now we have this thing called a grassland that evolves. Because there was no such thing as a grassland until there were animals that could eat grass. It's kind of, uh, necessarily think of it that way. And then all of a sudden, rumination develops. And now all of a sudden we're off to the races and we've got dozens and dozens of different species of primarily, so horses used to be browsers and then they evolved the capacity to eat some grass. Now all of a sudden with, with the development of the rumen, now we have dozens of species that only eat grass and they're getting all their, and, and literally right, at, bet, right between 30 and 20 million years ago we went from no grasslands on planet earth to being grasslands being a dominant ecosystem on every uh, continent. So grasslands took over the world about 25 million years ago and what's cool about that and what's relevant to today is because what grasslands do that no other ecosystem does, these are forested landscapes, this is the soil profile. The forests don't create soil, they create humus and a layer of compost up at the surface. They don't build soil. Grasslands build soil. A 
basalts, the grassland soils. They build soils from the bottom up and from the top down as grazing animals. I think I've got a slide here. These root masses down below ground, animals come and graze off the top half of those grass plants, and these, uh, these, the roots of these grass plants, they slough off the bottom half of the roots in response to that grazing. It's the same thing happens to a tree. If you cut off the top half of a tree, it'll slough off half of its roots. Grasses are the same way. If you cut off the top half of grasses, it's going to slough off the bottom half of its roots. And what that does, it just feeds the soil, boom, a resource. It's sugar, water, and, 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 and carbon, which microbes then chew up and turn into topsoil. That's from the bottom up. They're also, you're imagining, imagine a, a herd of 100 bison walking down the Kickapoo Valley. So as they're walking, not only are they grazing, but they're also trampling. Lots of vegetation is getting smushed into the ground where now it's available as food for microbes, which then turn it into topsoil. So, and what happens is, and what we mimic in our system of rotational grazing is we graze it down, let those roots slough off, and then we let it go. And then we let that grass grow back. And we give it about a month or six weeks of rest during the growing season, and then it gets up to do another foot or 18 inches tall, and then we bring the cows back in and we slough it off again. And we graze it down, and then uh, we can do that about five or six times depending on the season per year. And each time we do that, it's a pump that's pumping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the plants, into the soil, building soil. And that soil is stable. It's not going anywhere. I'm not going to till the land. The second you plow, it oxidizes the carbon in the, in the topsoil, and that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. But the soil is like a, a, a savings account. As long as you don't till it, it just accumulates. Do you, do you graze sheep that often? Yes. But the sheep are in a little bit Five different of a circumstance because they eat a slightly different mix of, of species, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, what we do with the sheep. Okay. So this is the, 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 the cow grass carbon pump um, that is useful now. And this, this is the other thing, too. And they say we need to like feed the world with GMOs and stuff. There was more bison in North America 200 years ago than there are cows today. No corn. Americans were growing it in their villages, but they weren't feeding it to the bison. I guarantee you that. They were keeping them out of their gardens, one way or another. Uh, and so we, you know, we we can restore ecosystems that produce a lot of food. The, the key is it is it takes work. You know, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So, um, so we're going back to this guy. So now you throw a ground sloth in there. That's going to change the succession dynamics a little bit. Then we get our big open grown oak trees. Now we've got our savanna. So I want you to look down here. They say, this is Wikipedia. Biodiversity, biomass, and soil layer just generally linearly increases up through succession. Well, that's just wrong. <laughs> because when you have a savanna that's being grazed, biodiversity is way higher in a savanna than in a closed canopy forest. Because you have all the niches and little habitats for all the different animals. We need some closed canopy forests. There's a lot of species that, that need or obligate closed canopy forests. That's fine. But there's a lot of savanna obligates and there's a lot of open grassland birds and stuff that we just don't have anymore because we don't have that habitat anymore. And so biodiversity is way higher in this intermediate succession. Biomass, if we start to include animals, is way higher. I mean, not even, it's like off the charts. You start including the biomass of bison and elk and Elephants, well, let's grow some elephants. It's close to we can get. Um, and in soil layer, this is a joke because these closed canopy forests don't accumulate topsoil, they accumulate a humus layer that stays relatively constant through time. And so savannas are, are max each of these out in a way that the climax forest cannot do. Um, and so what this means is that as life evolved on Earth, you know, forests came first before savannas. Forests came first before there was dinosaurs that could even eat any plants. So the earth was covered in forests for literally hundreds of millions of years before any animal evolved the ability to eat it. The first savannas, I would call them proto-savannas, were dino-created because we're talking about the mastodons. You're going to start talking about brontosaurus. How much... It, it, 
leaves, those guys could need it one day. But anyway, so savannas are an emergent property of, uh, it's like the highest expression of the evolution of life on this planet is in the savanna. So it's like plant, the species evolve through time, ecosystems evolve through time, and savannas are the, the, the highest uh, uh, species of ecosystems that Earth has evolved so far. And the key thing is that they are maintained by keystone species. Uh, whether they're mastodons or Native Americans or, or us. I think this is a good place to take a break. We'll talk about how we become keystone species after a break. And, and read pretty much everything that he wrote uh, when I was in graduate school. And he was so far ahead of his time. Coming from my perspective now, I got a little frustrated because he was so close to putting all the pieces together. You know, he would talk about how important it was for farmers to embrace con conservation. And what that meant to Leopold was that set a little side away from your crops, a little bit of land, and grow some prairie. Grow, plant some trees. Have, take some of your land out of agricultural production and give it to nature because nature needs it. And he's 100% right about that. But what Leopold didn't do was take it to the next step, which was that we can conserve land, we can restore our, these ecosystems by producing food which is what the Native Americans were doing. And it wasn't until I really started studying the Native Americans that I, that I realized that, that wait a second, we can, we can produce, because this was one of the problems I was having in, in, in graduate school, studying ecology, studying restoration ecology, being involved in all these projects where we go out, and it would either be university land or a, or a wealthy landowner that would want to do quote unquote restoration, and we'd go and we'd look up, okay, well, this is historically Oak Savannah or Tall Grass Prairie, and we would make a list of the bad species. And then we'd make a list of the good species. And we'd go out there with hand-to-hand -hand combat, chemical warfare, and go against the bad species. And then we would try to make room for the good species. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but the way I was thinking about it was this was a really expensive to do. So it was really only available for kind of wealthy landowners. It was really small scale if this was ever going to percolate into the landscape, this kind of activity. But the, only, the thing that I saw at the university is we'd go and we'd clear buckthorn out from under oak trees. And with a big volunteer crews, a freshman out of the dorm, we'd come with herbicide and we'd come with hand saws and we'd clear an acre of, of buckthorn and then three years later, it's buckthorn again. So it was, it was a sustainable model for using labor <laughs> at the university, which is a ready resource, but it wasn't a sustainable way to restore any kind of ecosystem. So anyway, uh, I decided that's not what I wanted to do with my life, and I realized that Native Americans were, these ecosystems that we're trying to restore, Native Americans were managing them intentionally because they produce food. So it made it my mission to restore these ecosystems, to produce food, and see if I can do it in a way that's economically profitable enough by selling the, the products of the ecosystem to support my family. So that's my mission in life. We'll see if I'm going to be successful or not. So the biomechanics of all this are actually fairly simple. There's rotational grazing. There's uh, planting trees. There's um, pruning. There's all kinds of things we can do to restore the land. That's actually like the really easy stuff. Like you can teach it to kids and they can figure it out pretty quick. The really hard thing is making the psychological transition to allow you to make the right decisions on the land. Because the way most of us have been programmed from birth is in a paradigm that doesn't allow us to see what's really happening on the land and it and it pushes us to make to, to value things that create decision-making complexes in our heads that we tend to make bad decisions about what to do on the land. And I'm not going to go through all of these. This is not the new to most of you. But like integrating instead of segregating, right? So Leopold was saying we segregate. We have crops over here and we have nature over here. And I'm saying we've got to integrate those things. We've got to produce food from a functioning ecosystem. And uh, 
this is probably like the most important, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it because there's a lot of other things to talk about. But I just wanted to bring it up to you because it's something I think about a lot and I think it's really important for all of us to go through because like I'm raising two kids right now and so my goal is to raise them so like this is their program. So they're going to get to be my age one day and they're going to be like, oh, I got a deep program from how I was programmed for my parents. Like, fair enough, right? Fair enough. But we were all programmed this way, and so if we want to transition to here, it's hard work. It's not something we just read a book and go, like, oh, yeah, okay, I got it. Got it. Linear, complex, simple, okay, I got it. This is like deep seated stuff that takes years and years of processing to start changing our thinking patterns. One of the things that we try to do on our farm is we think, like, how is this decision going to impact our land, our family, 100 years from now? And like we don't necessarily make a decision based on that, but it's something we think about. Uh, and it helps us get a little different kind of perspective. So anyway, I'm going to talk about our farm, Mastodon Valley Farm. Uh, this is the Kickapoo River, this is Viola right here. So we're just outside of Viola, uh, just uh, outside of Viola and uh, uh, south of Highway 56. This, this is Highway 56 right here, so if you're ever coming uh, uh, east of Viola, you can, you can see this half of our farm just from 56. This was a crop field. We've since planted to native prairie, and we've put about 5,000 trees uh, uh, in that field. You can see the tree tubes from the highway. Um, this is the family. We've been out there six years now, and we started in a tent. <laughs> without kids. And then we realized we were going to have a kid and we needed a house. So I cut down some trees and built a cabin. And then we decided to have another kid and it's like, oh, I need another house, a bigger house. So I thought by now that the house would be done, but uh, it's not quite there yet. So we got two kids in a, in a little, a tiny cabin, but the bigger house is coming. We'll make it. Okay, driftless landscape is fractal. People know what fractal means. It means Patterns are, uh, are self-similar across scale. So what's the definition of a savanna? It's about 50% open, 50% closed, 50% canopy cover of trees. Well, if you look at a map of the driftless area, I see 50% forest and about 50% open land. And if you zoom in, this is our farm, it's about any, any scale that you look at the driftless area, if you look at 1,000 acres or 500 acres or 40 acres, once you get lower than 40, it's not quite, but even at about 40, especially 80, it's almost always half forest and half open. So there's some exceptions if you're like right up on the ridge in little crop fields, but it's, it's pretty, pretty common to have half open, half closed. So it's half open, half closed, but if we want a savanna, we don't want you know, 100 acres of forest and 100 acres of pasture, we want savanna. So our goal is clearing <coughs> woods, especially woods that are former savannas, because you can see the big old open grown trees in there that have since been grown up with other stuff. Uh, and then we're planting trees in the open areas. So there's some crop ground here, crop ground up here, that's all been planted to trees. We've planted trees along some of our fence lines, uh, interior, so we're trying to get trees in our pastures and then we're thinning out. This is a lot of work, thinning out. Oh, it's really steep hillside, a lot of work. Um, but we have help, and I'll, I'll get into that. Here's a map of the farm, how we have it laid out, our rotational grazing. So we'll start over here and zoom across and come back. Each one of these little squares is a paddock. Um, and uh, that's how we graze. Here's some of our cows. We raise red Devons, red Angus. Um, we've got about 20 cows, and then we finish out about 20 calves every year. Um, but we have to keep the cows, and then we have the calves, and then we have the yearlings, and then we have our, our stockers that we finish. Um, pigs, we don't breed any pigs, but we raise about 30 or 40 piglets every year and finish them out. Um, they're hard on the land. It's hard to keep these guys in ways that are not destructive. It's possible, but it just takes a lot of work. Uh, but they're really good at sealing ponds. If you ever want to dig a pond in sand, just let them roll around in for a couple days and it'll hold water. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> pure, pure sand. It's just phenomenal. They're awesome at that. So they, Because they're so destructive, I love good pasture. I'm like, OK, 
pigs aren't my favorite animal, but everybody loves bacon, so I keep growing. <laughs> and we're planting, the, the last big group of 5,000 trees we planted two years ago is for them. So we planted 3,000 hazelnut trees, uh, several hundred swamp white oaks, several hundred black walnuts, uh, about 500 mulberries, apples, uh, and it's just for them. Like, yeah, maybe if they're like really good one year, I'll go out and pick some for myself, but it's our, our single busy, busy, biggest expense with these guys is, is buying organic grain for them. And so any, I can cut that down, uh, the, the more the better. So we're planting fruit and nut trees for pigs so we can have the fruit and nut finished pork, which is awesome. Right now we let them run around in the oaks and hickories when, it, when they're when they're masking, but uh, but you got to be so careful because you don't want them ripping up the. Did the you have a plan to mention how uh, livestock can be used actually to like get rid of meaty parcels? If you have a swath of maybe thistle or something, that would be a good place to put your pigs. Yeah, um, in some cases that might work. They don't like thistle that much. They'll actually eat the top of it, but once you've got a full-grown thistle plant, they kind of avoid it like plague. So they, it actually kind of makes it worse because they'll go dig up everything around except the thistle. Um, but they can be used to, to modify the landscape. Uh, we use them for weeding areas if we're going to grow any kind of crop in or uh, uh, sometimes in a garden situation, although not in our home garden. Um, and then the, what we use mostly for weed control is sheep and goats. So we keep a... Uh, uh, we buy goats every year. We don't have a goats don't do well in our winter, so we don't try to overwinter them. I just buy them because I don't have a barn. But our sheep, we have wool sheep. They're a Rambouillet, which is a close relative of merino, so it's really really fine wool. And uh, Marine knits all of our clothes, which is amazing because the wool is so awesome. I mean, it's like the warmest, most beautiful thing for this climate. It's like amazing. So it's one of the reasons we have them. Another reason is because they help us clear out. Here's a baby bur oak tree growing up in the shade. Who knows how long it's been there in the shade. Um, so, you know, I'm out with a chainsaw. My sheep now, they know the chainsaw. So as soon as they hear that thing, they come running. And they love eating the tops of trees. Whether it's not all species, but they love elm. They love prickly ash. They, Multiflora rose is actually one of their favorite species. If you put them in the paddock, they'll go right to the multiflora rose first. Um, and so, we, when I first got, got to the farm, I was so excited about like releasing the oaks and clearing brush that we have one hillside that's all open grown, like, you know, ancient oaks, like the 200 year plus oaks. And they're all just covered in uh, prickly ash and multi-floor rows, so our first year, I'm up there with chainsaws and hand saws and clearing out and clearing out and clearing out. Well, I didn't have sheep yet. So I clear them all out, and by the end, at the spring, and by the fall, they're almost back up above browse hiding. And so then I realized, hey, 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 I need to take a chill pill here, and I'm gonna wait and clear this stuff out until I've got the animals that can keep it, can keep it down, because, you know, you got big prickly ash, you cut that thing down and it's going to immediately sprout. Those things have massive root systems, uh, all the brush does, and they re-sprout rapidly. But the cool thing is, is that re-sprout is super highly nutritious. It's way higher in nutrition than the top stuff of the old, old plants that you cut. And so it's super desirable for sheep and goats. So you can, you can keep it clear with sheep and goats, but uh, you've got to have them to, to, to maintain it. Uh, because a lot of the stuff that we have is above their heads. So it, it takes the hand work to get it to a place where they can maintain it. Does that make sense? So we do a lot of hand work, but you know what? The hand work is expensive and time consuming. You don't want to do that until you can like maintain it. At least that was what I learned. Um, we, we do a bunch of meat chickens. We raise them, uh, and this is in our restored prairie. And they chickens love being like in the shade of big plants. So they actually like love the prairie because there's so many big plants that they kind of hang out in. And you know, they're jungle fowl, so they're used to being in jungles in trees, and that's where how they protect themselves from their predators like hawks. And so whether it's tall grass prairie or hazelnut shrubs or um, hemp plants, they love to like get shaded down. Um, another thing we do at our farm is on-farm slaughter. So uh, all of the animals that get slaughtered on our farm and get sold for meat are slaughtered on the farm. 
which we used to not be able to do that. It's only in the last, well, three years ago, a natural harvest out of Spring Green in association with Prem Meats, um, they, got, they developed the, the state's first and only inspected mobile slaughter. So there's mobile slaughter guys around all over the place, but you're not legally allowed to sell any meat that comes out of that because it's not inspected. So the, the truck drives down. This is the state inspector, comes in a separate vehicle. He's standing right here watching. And this you know, two and a half year old steer shot literally feet away from where he was born, grazing grass. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I used to have to haul him to a slaughterhouse and trucks and trailers, and it's just stressful for everyone. It's no good. Uh, this is, I, I hope these guys stay in business. We sure give them a lot of business. Uh, but, because it's just an amazing thing that we're able to do. And it, from a humane perspective, it's obviously the way to go. I mean, there's just no comparison to any other model. It's the way to go. The other really cool thing is the minerals that we keep. So, you got a cow. And a cow spends its life grazing grass. And then you butcher that cow, and we eat the meat, right? Well, the meat itself is mostly the products of photosynthesis. It's carbon. But that animal's been grazing grass and accumulating minerals its whole life. So it's pulling minerals out of the soil with every bite that it eats. So if we take all the animals off of our farm, and the minerals go in the bones, and they go into organs. So in a cow, or any animal, the flesh is carbon, it's photosynthesis, a product of what they're eating, and the minerals go in the bones and in the organs. So when I shipped my cattle to a, uh, a slaughter plant, all that stuff just left. And I could get some of the bones back, but now we get all the bones back, and all the hide, and all the organs, uh, and the hooves, and the head, all that gets just left on the farm. They actually charge me if I want them to take it, which of course I don't. And he actually, a lot of people don't want to take it. So when he's out on a run he, and he's coming to my place, he saves stuff up because he knows I'll take it and put it in my compost pile. But before I put it in a compost pile, I just leave it out on the, on the ground because we have three dogs, our livestock guardian dogs that protect all the, the little critters. And they are doing a very valuable service. Because Have you ever seen a bone, like a deer bone or a cow bone, just sitting out in a pasture somewhere in the woods? What is it doing? It's just kind of sitting there, right? It's not going back to the soil. I mean, it will in a geologic time frame, but their bones are really recalcitrant. Like, they just hold on to their minerals, and they just sit there for long, long periods of time. Well, you should see how long it takes one of my dogs <laughs> to go through a bag, a 50-pound bag of bones. I mean, not very long. We're, we're really lucky. We have three big guard dogs, and we only have to feed them if we haven't had a slaughter within six weeks. So six weeks after slaughter, they don't get fed, they're eating this. And they're going all over the farm all night, pooping all those minerals back on the soil, closing the mineral loop. And this is like, mineralization is a major issue for our land and for our bodies. Because the way humans have been growing food in monocultures, all the food that we eat, now is mineral deficient. And every single year, a farm field is cropped, the food that comes out of that field has less minerals than the year before. So we're all demineralized. It doesn't matter how much food we eat, we're all demineralized. So we constantly, in the winter, when we have our wood stove on, have a big pot of stock going. And that's the bones with a little bit of water and vinegar cooking down so that we get our minerals uh, back in us and then we work to get the minerals back on the land. And this is sort of like a dilemma in, in modern agriculture that nobody really talks about is the mineral cycle and closing these loops. Now we have 50 CSA customers. There's other ways I could close the mineral loop with my customers that I won't go into the details of. <laughs> but I think about those kinds of things because in the end, it's, we've got to close these cycles because the earth is, you know, land is finite and we can't keep pulling minerals out of the ground and not getting them back in. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to get the minerals in ourselves and back on the land. Uh, covering soil, bare soil is really bad for the land. It's bad for the land and it's really bad for the water. 
So there was a bunch of land across the street from us. We're in a valley, our main valley. Across the street from us is a ridge. So half that ridge drains onto our property. It's it always been a CRP, and about 15, 10, 15 years ago they planted pine trees. So it was just grassland and pine trees. We had eight, nine inch rain events, and the culvert that drains those fields never ran. Two years ago, an Amish guy bought it, uh, uh, rented off the land to another guy who spent a month on a bulldozer bulldozing all the trees out, and then came and plowed the whole thing and planted it all the corn. And we're talking slopes like this. We just planted straight to corn, no contour strips, just straight corn. A three inch rain event, the culvert fills up and washes out of the ground. Eight inches of rain had never sent a drop of water onto our farm from that property when it was in perennial grass cover. And one three inch rain event once it turned to corn and we have massive culverts full of water just flowing onto our farm. So anyway, this stuff really matters. Like bare soil is bad. Uh, so one of my things is I just, I get a little bit sick in my stomach if I see a bare spot of ground on our soil and I'll go like feed a hay bale there or something just to cover it up so that when it rains it doesn't erode any more soil. So when we got to our farm, there was one crop field uh, that had been in corn continuously for a long time. And so we uh, immediately pulled it out and planted native prairie here. Another thing I want to point out is this is a really steep hillside, and it's really thin soil. It's real sandy, so this, it doesn't grow a whole lot of good grass. This was the first year here. It grew terrible grass. So every winter, I feed some hay bales up there, which is really dangerous on the tractor because it's so steep. <laughs> I always do a few. Uh, and I actually ran chickens up there one year, and now it's like super lush and green, amazing forage up there. But um, this is another way, you know, gravity is constantly pulling carbon and minerals, topsoil, down. And animals, salmon, have a, are a mechanism of returning minerals against gravity and getting them back out onto the landscape via bears and, and other things that eat salmon. So that's cool nutrient cycle. We can do that too. We can reverse gravity, and we should. Alba Leopold has an has a essay called The Journey of X, where he talks about um, uh, erosion and, and gravity being the ultimate tug, and that we as humans should be obligated to like reverse gravity and get nutrients back, back up on the hills, back in the soils. Uh, planting a lot of trees, uh, trying to get trees back on the landscape or in the open areas. Here's some of them coming up. So this, this is really cool. This was all crop field. We planted the prairie, we planted the trees. For the first time this year, in over 100 years, cows were back on that field. And just watching that cow poop on the land was just so satisfying. Like we're, getting, we're actually fertilizing and re-inoculating um, this soil, which has been so dead for so long. You know, the perfect, the perfect inoculate for soil is exactly uh, what comes out of a cow's rear end. So it's pretty cool that way. Nature is pretty amazing. Um, we're clearing a lot of trees, so uh, we try to find ways to use them. So we've been building things. Timber framing is cool because you can, it's, it's less building actually. I've been doing a whole bunch of two by fours. I used to do big coasting beams. And then I got good guys like Leaf and Mike here helping me put them up into, into cool structures. So it's been pretty fun. Uh, mushrooms is another thing we can do. Uh, shiitake, Mike's got a big lion's mane garden and that he started last year with a bunch of stuff that we cut out of the woods. So, um, you know, always trying to be creative with firewood, obviously. We get a lot, pull a lot of firewood out of the woods in our clearing, but uh, trying to be creative about other ways to utilize it. It's a really valuable resource, and if we're going to cut down a tree, you want to, like, honor that tree, right? You don't want to just, like, you know, ignore it and just cut it down and forget about it. You want to, like, honor that living being in one way or another. Um, we grow all our own vegetables. I shouldn't say we. I don't grow any vegetables. <laughs> My wife Maureen grows vegetables. Uh, and so tilling is really bad for the land. And so we're always trying to figure out ways of not tilling. And so we grow all of our vegetables in a way with no tillage. We actually have, now, this is really funny, we used to go out and look for morels in the spring. Well, for some reason, you know, we no till. Now they're just popping up in our garden, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Um, so we, we're growing our vegetables, and, and this is a way we can get more mineral dense vegetables because we're not tilling the soil, we're not engaging in this, in this negative process that, that uh, has negative consequences on the land and in our health. 
So much healthier vegetables come out of gardens that are no-till. Um, this year we're experimenting on large-scale no-tills. So we grew a half acre of hemp this year on a no-till. So normally the way hemp is grown is they go out and they uh, plow. So they till the land and then put out strips of plastic and then transplant uh, hemp seedlings into it. So I'm thinking about how, how can I do no-till at scale in a way that's not just crazy labor? Because Marine's no-till garden is very labor intensive. You know, that's a lot of work. Uh, I, I don't want to do that at a big scale. So what I did is I just went out and was like, okay, I'm going to prep this ground. So I just went and fed a bunch of hay bales to the cows over where I wanted to, to grow hemp. And they eat them and they stomp on them and spread them out and poop and pee everywhere. And then, so this is growing between two rows of trees. And then we just plop the hay bales out in the spring before, before the growing season, let them all grow. And well, that just created a mat just like the plastic. So no, no plants near them. It's a perfect mulch. And it's fertilized, so we just transplanted into the, the hay pack, and uh, we had a phenomenal crop uh, of hemp. Way, way better than average in terms of yield and, and quality. So uh, that's a new product we've got now, in addition to our meat, is, is CBD oil. And we make sab, or Marine makes sab with um, our tallow from our cows, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so this is a way of growing an annual plant and we've done I've done this method with corn and it works great too. We can do about an acre reasonably uh, with almost no labor which is pretty cool. Uh, and so we tried hemp this year it worked really well. So a way of doing no-till annuals at a larger scale uh, is something we're constantly thinking about. Uh, and so this is like this is the dream, right? We're getting back this this oak savanna. And and then the key for us is like you eating the whole ecosystem, right? Because it's not just about the meat, it's not just about the plants or the nuts. You know, we go out and we harvest the acorns and we process them in the creek, and then it's like our daughter Tilly's favorite food. Um, and so, just trying to figure out how to embrace the whole ecosystem for our diet, uh, and we think that that's going to be the best health for us and be best for the land. So our farm, our, our main mechanism for selling meat is through our meat CSA. So we sell bundles of beef, pork, and chicken that are, it's like a monthly, we call it a CSA, it's not really a CSA because it's a monthly thing. So people just sign up and then it's just like a monthly thing. You get a bundle of meat. Um, and we just now started shipping those. We're actually shipping those around, around the area, which has been interesting. But, um, it's really good meat. It's just that's the cool thing. It's like when you do the right thing, when you give the animals the right context, they reward you with this product that's so amazing. You, you can't replicate it. You go to Whole Foods, you're going to spend more money on a product that is far inferior. Uh, that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, we got some big challenges coming up real quick. Uh, this article was published today, January 8th, 2020, in The Guardian. Lab-grown food will destroy farming and save the planet. <laughs> this guy's <is> serious. <laughs> He's serious. Um, there's there serious challenges to doing this, not to mention the, the, the lab-grown food thing, which is going to be coming up a really big challenge. Um, and the economics of doing what we're doing is really difficult because you can get ground beef for $2 a pound. I mean, I guarantee you, you cannot go down to your local sale barn, buy the cheapest cull cow there, take it to a processor, get it ground up into ground beef, it's going to cost more than $2 a pound. Just the processing costs more than that. So what that means, they're losing money on ground beef, but it gets you in the door, which is what Walmart does with milk, which is one of the reasons why milk farmers aren't getting paid anything. Is because they use milk to get people in the door and they make their money selling other things. Um, so that's a problem. And one thing I want to mention here is that it's really easy to, like, you know, I've been really critical of conventional farming here, and rightly so in my opinion, but the farmers themselves are doing the best that they can. And when I was in graduate school, I used to be pretty, like, I don't know, not a very nice person. <laughs> you know, I would be very critical of farm farmers thinking that they were like these fat cats you know, making all this money doing Monsanto, and like now that I move out here, it's like, yeah, yeah, nobody's making any money. 
everybody's just trying to survive. And uh, it's brutal. I mean, we, you're all are aware of what's going on in the milk world and all that. Like, it's brutal what's happening right now. And so we're really on this precipice because if things, trends continue the way they're going and all the farmers go out of business, this is what's going to happen. I mean, there's just not going to be any other option. And the economics are making it really, really, really hard for farmers of any type good ones, bad ones, whatever, farming is hard and it's not making any money. And so if we want to have food from farms and not from a lab, they genetically engineer bacteria to eat dead fetal cells from uh, dead calves, from fe uh, fetuses they pull out of cows. It's like, is that where you want to get your food? Of course not. Soil, water, air, sunshine. That's where I want to get my food. Um, if we want to have any short shot at what I'm talking about and having food for people in cities grown by farmers in a responsible way, we're going to need five, 5 million new farmers in the next yeah. 10, 20 years. So, that ain't easy. Uh, if you've got any ideas on how to do that, I'm all ears. We need more, though. We need more here. I mean, we live in the best place in the United States in terms of like the number and quality of small farms around us. Like we're in the epicenter right here, so that's awesome. But the rest of the country is a desert and they don't have much of anything. Um, one time I was at a bar and I was kind of talking about what we were doing on our farm and how we were trying to restore the landscape and a guy responded, and I'll never forget this, he said, well, he was like, I, I, I can't change the land. Like, I can't make any difference on the land. He's like, I don't know. I don't own any land. I'm never going to own land. I can't make any difference. Three times a day, we engage in an act that determines, determines, not suggests, but determines what happens on the land. So every single one of us, I mean, it's good to, like, drive a Prius instead of a Suburban, maybe. But what really matters is what we're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so we all, every person in the world, not only do they have the ability to change the land, they have the responsibility to. And to me, that means not buying lab-grown meat. That's not the kind of businesses that I want to support. But buying food from local farmers that are doing the right thing. Whether that's like no-till, or grass-fed, or organic, or whatever it is, we all have the ability to make a difference and to change the whole world. Literally overnight. I mean, it really wouldn't take that long if everybody got on board. So anyway, um, we do have the power whether you own land or not. And it takes community. Not just us individual, but us collectively. It takes communities of people working together to accomplish these things. Uh, one of our big community events, we run every year a, uh, uh, a course on our farm. People come from all over. Um, we have one every summer, and then on the summer solstice we have a big party. Anybody are here next next summer? We'll have a big party on the solstice, and we bring together people from the community, uh, have like wine tastings and food, and, and and try to bring people together to have a good time. Uh, and if we're gonna make a big difference, you know, we're gonna have to do it individually, but we're also gonna have to do it together. study a couple years ago that looked at, you know, what's the best way to feed these growing populations? And it's, just, you know, it's like hundreds of scientists and they spent a year analyzing all this data and their conclusion was small farms are more productive and resilient than big farms. And that the more small farms we have, the more, the higher quality food and the more resilient that food system is going to be for the future. Our land base, I can supply on our land base easily uh, the meat, well, I don't know if I could do the milk too, but probably could if I really pushed it. But I could definitely do like meat, eggs, uh, and vegetables for 100 families. 
on 100 acres. So, you know, it's just math. But it's, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not easy to see how to go from here to there. Yeah. Where does your hay come from? Uh, we buy hay. So, and that's our big vulnerability right now because hay prices are so incredibly expensive and this is the second year in a row. So that's really kind of killing us right now. But um, we buy hay and then I spread it on higher areas to, to me, we're, we're going to start cutting our own hay soon. We just got uh, some flat land that we can uh, access, that we can cut hay. So that's going to help a lot. But when you look at the price of hay in a normal year, round bale might cost 35, 40 bucks. Well, it's going to cost you 15 to 20 bucks to make it, if all goes well. But there's all the fertilizer value in that, because no matter how you feed it out, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent is going to get wasted. Waste which the farmers don't like. But if you put that on a thin soil, rich top field, and you feed it up there, that's all that carbon's going back into the soil, making topsoil, which holds onto water, makes you more drought resilient, and gives you better forage the next year. So the fertilizer value of feeding bought hay is actually pretty good. But you know, from a global perspective, it's like, well, it's coming from somewhere. Somewhere, and they're not going so, to their land. They're, not necessarily. But um, so, um, are you working with stockpiling for it at all? We have done some stockpiling. Yeah, yeah. It's in order to have the, the challenge with stock. So stockpiling forage means you can <coughs> not graze certain paddocks during the end of the growing season, and then even after everything goes dormant, you can graze them later, which does work. Uh, the problem for us is that to have enough cattle to stay on top of the vegetation that we have from May to July means that we, we don't have the, the ability to, to set enough aside to stockpile. We would need twice as much land, essentially, um, or half the number of cows. So, yeah. Uh, meat farming is not sustainable. OK. Emissions, I mean, in a global perspective, it just isn't going to hold up. Everything will work. Okay. Well, um, emissions. I'm just trying to think of what our emissions are. Well, you, you got transportation. You got the whole industrial. Well, all, all I'm, food, I'm thinking of transportation. Where I'm, th I'm thinking of emissions that are exclusive to us that would not be the case for say if we if we just sold if we just converted all of our land to soybeans. We would have more, way more emissions because we'd need more tractors and equipment and then packing infrastructure. And there'd be lots of emissions for soybeans. Is I'm there trying to. Methane emissions there are methane emissions, so that's one thing. One cool thing about grass methane. Methane is a problem. Methane is a problem. It's a greenhouse gas. It's a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon. The really cool thing about uh, grasslands, healthy grasslands, is that there's methanotrophic bacteria in the soil. So cows burp methane when they're grazing grass, and the bacteria in the soil eat that methane and convert it into CO2, neutralizing its negative, the bulk of its negative impact. So, um, versus corn fed beef. Versus corn fed beef, or any confined animal where they're not grazing on healthy grasslands. And then you've got the fact that we're sequestering carbon by grazing. It's like, show me a vegetable farm that is sequestering carbon. Can Not that there, I don't have anything against can vegetables. Can, I mean, I can, 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 can the world grow beef for 10 million people? Absolutely. That's without question. Partially because we're using marginal land. This is, we're not taking much arable land out of production. I mean, we have done some. Um, partially because I'm an ecologist and I just want to get a prairie going. And the easiest way to do that is on all the cropland. But uh, uh, <coughs> there's a lot of marginal grasslands in the world. And the cool thing about the way we're doing it is that we're every year we're increasing the productivity of the land. So we're taking marginal land, getting a yield off of it, and by getting that yield, we're making it so that next year we can get more of a yield off of that same marginal land. And you look at the driftless hillsides, I mean, they didn't used to be forested. And now, every driftless hillside is forested. You can drive around everywhere. It's 
very rare to see a hillside that's green, that's in pasture. It's, it's all forest, which, I, you know, I don't have anything against forest. However, think about how many acres that is of potentially productive land. And some of that's too steep for cattle. Cattle don't like walking up steep hills, but sheep, goats, love that stuff. Uh, and would really throw, well here's one right here, where it's a little bit open still. It's, it's not being managed anymore, so it's, it's turning into forest. But, um, but those hillsides are great for producing meat in a way that is creating habitat for wildlife, sequestering carbon in the soil, and maintaining a vegetation that soaks up ground, soaks up rainwater, and replenishes our aquifers. Yeah? Um. People are talking now about instead of a single family farm model, yes. an eco village model. Yes. So that's less uh, you know, stress and yes. kind of single couple and yep. so on. This is great, it sounds great. Yep. It does sound great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it's yeah. more of a inter interpersonal getting the skills to yep. work together. Yeah. There's a there's a paradigm shift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's also getting kids who are in their 20s and 30s on the land instead of waiting until their 50s and 60s to be able to afford a farm. Well, it's keeping them out of college so they don't go into a debt. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, Steve. Um, So the question is about uh, prairie mix versus traditional uh, grass mix for hay production, and it's too early to tell. I haven't cut hay yet. Uh, we haven't even got full growing season. They're still, it's only two years old, the big one. Um, so, to be determined. You've got to bale it? Yeah. Is it also too big to tell? How's the oak generation going? Oak? Yeah. Like natural regeneration or what we're planting? Natural regeneration, we've got a fair amount of natural regeneration that I'm very happy with in certain areas. Um, and they're areas that are on the edge. They're in edges. So they're on edges where the cattle graze on one side but not the other side. And there's regeneration happening on both sides of the fence. Um, and one thing I've noticed that I, I was surprised by, neither sheep, goats, or cattle will browse a very young seedling, which I was really surprised by. I think they might be titanic. Maybe I think when they're a little bit bigger, they might be more collier, but I don't know. Yeah. Question. Uh, I read a book about uh, recovering land back to Oak Savannah. It seems like bison is the ultimate. Yeah. I see no bison in this area whatsoever. I see elk, I see everything else under the sun, but no yeah. bison. Is it because of the fencing that is so onerous that is stopping us? Or? I mean, I think part of it's cultural. You know, people are just, you know, used to cows. And it's good or meat. Um, for me, personally, I get that question quite a bit of, like, why don't you raise bison? And, um... Yeah, I milk the bison. Well, that's true. Well, I don't know if that's true. Or not. I've never tried. I, don't know if that's true. I wouldn't want to try. Uh, but but bison are more like they're less domesticated, right? So they have these instincts to roam. I mean, those guys used to migrate back and forth from Texas every year. So putting them in a little hundred acre farm. That's fences. next. Getting rid of all the fences. Well, I've talked quite a bit about that. Um, developing migratory corridors and all that kind of stuff to, to actually get animals moving back and forth again instead of you know, cutting and buying hay. Uh, but yeah, that's a huge challenge. But yeah, I just would feel bad confining bison, personally. There is bison um, farming out there, and it is delicious. There's lots of bison farming out there. Right. On a large scale. Yeah. 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 Yes, I've seen bison on as low as like 20 acres. Oh. Yes, question. Right, so I was kind of, back to the one guy's question. Um, so I was kind of curious, what kind of uh, prairie grass you did try to um, uh, yes. put in there? And then as you opened the woods, um, did you plant that, or was it, did it just sort of naturally come up and maybe some native grasses? Or yes. Or was it end up growing? We've done, a, we've done <clears throat> lots of experimenting with all of those scenarios. So in, um, uh, you know, we planted the prairie and we did, you know, big blue, little blue, Indian grass, 
and then Forbes. Uh, and in the areas that we're clearing, I've come in and planted forage. Like I've planted cool season grasses, I've planted warm season grasses, I've planted uh, uh, clover. And then I've not planted anything and just seen what comes up, which usually is kind of like the same thing. Uh, and so I'm doing less seeding in the areas that I'm clearing now because it's just coming up in what I would want anyway. Uh, not so much natives, but the cool season grasses and legumes that are good forage for the animals. I'm not a purist when it comes to uh, prairies, and when I planted prairies, I planted I planted prairie everywhere, and then I came in because I've, I've got an idea, and I don't know if it'll work, but I'm going to try it. So we planted the whole thing to prairie, and then I did strips within that of alfalfa and cool season grasses. And I think that because uh, we have the problem with warm season grasses in our area is that most of our year is cool season. We actually don't have a lot of good weather for warm season grasses, and ju I mean just warm season grasses, which means that if you have just warm season grasses in a place, a good chunk of the potential photosynthesis in that year is going to be unutilized, and it's going to be essentially bare ground. So not bare ground because there's vegetation there, but not photosynthesizing. And so we need to maximize the amount of photosynthesis that we're getting all the time. So my dream is to have like lush timothy grass and alfalfa that I graze in the spring, and I graze it hard until just about you know June, and then let it go and let the warm season grasses come up, graze those at the end of the summer, and then I have all fall where I can get some cool season grass growth in. I've never seen that happen. To me, theoretically, it's possible. I just did a road trip all the way down to South Texas and back, like Mexico, South Texas, and back, and I was looking, and you get down below uh, the Red River, which separates Oklahoma and um, Texas, north of that river, it's cool season grass dominant, everything, and you go south of that river, and it's immediately warm season grass, everything, there's almost no cool season grass, except in cattle pastures where they've nuked it and planted, but the native vegetation down there is warm season grass because it's so hot, cool season grass just doesn't like it down there, so anyway, it's something. This is something I think about a lot, cool season grass versus warm season grass. There's a whole part of this presentation that I took out because it's a little nerdy and it gets into the, his the evolutionary history of cool season grasses versus warm season. Uh, and it gets into carbon dioxide and the ice ages and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I think about those things a lot. Yeah. What do you see as your, uh, some of your largest concerns regarding climate change for your farm? Well, we're, we, we're experiencing it now. I mean, we get flooded is a big thing. And then the, the way it experiences us most directly is its impact on things like hay prices. So last year, hay bales floated away. This year, it was too wet to get into the spring and fall. So we're paying three, four times as much as normal for hay, which is by far our biggest expense on our farm. And uh, so you know, we're trying to figure out how to. One of the reasons we grew hemp this year is just trying to raise some money to uh, um, to pay back some of our debts from from last year's hay. Now we got this year's. How are we gonna take it through? So we're you know, we're on the front. I mean, anytime you're trying to make a living off the land, like you're 100% exposed. There's no buffer. So yeah, we feel it. I mean, every time we have a flooding event and all of our flood gaps and our fences wash out, I gotta get out there and repair fencing. Which talking to my neighbors, he said he had to do like once in the 70s. And I'm out there, like it's like it's almost like a regular thing. It's like, oh, me and John are gonna go meet at the fence again. We had another gully washer last night. Um, see him down there, and we'll be we'll chat about it while we're in the fence and cursing ourselves. Yeah. Uh, how do you communicate these ideas to conventional farmers who are exclusively bottom line driven? Thank you for asking that question. So, how do you uh, uh, communicate with farmers? I try not well. This, it reminds me of two things I want to say. One thing is about, you know, we've been talking about climate change. The last question was about climate change, climate change, climate change. I don't think about climate change anymore, even though I'm 100% exposed to it, and I certainly don't talk about it. So that's one thing. So we're talking about changes on the landscape that are, and if you notice this whole talk I talked about, how many times did I talk about solving climate change? Zero. Zero. Okay. So, because if I go to my neighbor and I start harping about climate change, 
well, climate change is a trigger word. And he's automatically going to shut down and, and write me off as some weird hippie. <laughs> so I'm going I'm to tell a quick story. Uh, when we first got to our farm, we were digging some swales, planting some trees, setting the fences all over, and one of my neighbors, good old boy Redneck, stops by in his pickup truck. He says, what the heck are you guys doing up on that hill? And so I'm explaining, you know, like, when it rains, the water just rushes and forms this gully and causes soil erosion. So we're digging these channels to bring that water out to the hillside so that the valley doesn't flood. And since we're going through all that trouble, we're going to plant some trees here so those trees get passively irrigated, right? That's not that complicated. <laughs> and, and he just kind of like thinks about it and he's kind of confused and he leaves. And I don't see him for another month. Well, a month later, he comes roaring down our street and peels into our farm driveway. Peter, 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 Peter! I'm like, what? Like, okay, I walk over and say, what's going on? He's like, he was like, I was up all night last night thinking about what you were talking about, and I realized something. He said, if all these farmers around here did what you did, Bio he's from Viola. Viola wouldn't flood anymore. <laughs> then he said, and there would be fruit everywhere for everyone to eat. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so, how do we communicate? A, we communicate by doing, right? It's just, just do it. And then B, be open about it, but not condescending. And don't use trigger words. Don't say I'm like saving the world from climate change. Because A, that's not true. I mean, that's demonstrably not true. And B, what does that help anybody? So, so you mentioned swales, so if you put in key lines, We've done phone. some of that, yes. Does it work? Does it work? Um, and it, you know, we can divert water different places for sure. Um, I, when we first started, I was under the impression that that was helpful to kind of rehydrate the land. What I've observed is that swales can move water. They're excellent, you know, you can engineer it and build it so that it moves water from one place to another. And if you've got a reason to do that, it's a great thing to do. In terms of like rehydrating, what I see having much bigger impact is adding carbon to the topsoil. So our methods of grazing, putting hay out and bale grazing in the winter adds carbon to the soil. Carbon holds on to water. When it rains, the more carbon you have in the soil, the more your water holding capacity, and it's by orders of magnitude. I mean, just a couple percentage increases in topsoil, organic matter, and you've increased your, uh, top, your water holding capacity by hundreds of thousands of gallons of water per acre. So that's where I'm focusing on in terms of just general landscape rehydration is in building topsoil. But we still use swales to move water here, here and there for specific purposes but I don't treat it as a general thing that we should do to make the land better. Yeah. Are you working with like, NRCS? Yes. We've worked quite a bit with NRCS for grazing, especially taking cropland out, planting natives, and uh, setting up the infrastructure for rotational grazing. The NRCS has been super helpful. So they have a whole new slew of stuff coming out with tree crops and alley crops in a whole. Thank goodness. So, um, and it's, it, they need people to push. Okay. From, so you should talk. I'll, I'll talk to, uh -huh. to our original county guy. Yeah, when we first it's started. Like the forester. Kind of the, the, the okay. Forester when I first started, I talked to him about that, and I had to actually be really careful with my language because they can't fund rotational grazing. You can't graze in the woods. Right, right. So if you're talking about planting trees, they're like, oh, we can't fund rotational grazing if you're going to plant trees. It's like, wait, really? So now they're pushing. So this is but exactly getting they've gotten it. They've gotten it. Okay, like good. But it's another, it's like I'm really, really happy to hear that. Yeah. But they need help. Yeah. Can you do this without cows? Like yes. If you're limited, like, sheep will have the same effect even though they don't. Yeah. Like, just the, yeah. Like, the density that you rotate them? animals eating grass pooping. Yeah. You know, they're, you're, you know, when I talk, when I first started, I talked about a functional ecosystem is one that's diverse and has a trophic structure, right? It has a food web. So it's got sun, it's got plants, and it's got animals eating plants. So like animals eating plants is, without that, you don't have an ecosystem. You go to a nature preserve, and there might be some deer in there, but it's not really an ecosystem. A lot of our landscapes actually aren't what I would call an ecosystem. They're a plant community, 
and there's values to having that, but for an ecosystem to be, to close the loop, you've got to have herbivores and then predators, and then that connects the cycle. And so we use ourselves and our dogs as the predators, uh, and then we try to get as many herbivores on the landscape. And the cool thing about multi-species grazing is that each species of livestock has a slightly different browse preference of what they want to eat. So uh, cows eat grass primarily, and clover, and some woody vegetation. Goats eat mostly woody vegetation, a little bit of grass. Sheep are kind of more 50-50, and they like the forbs. Um, they're great if you've got like a parsnip problem or uh, goldenrod. Um, but, uh, but yeah, to answer your question, I mean, as long as they're eating plants, I mean, go goose, right? Geese eat um, grass. So I've seen pretty effective high density grazing systems in like a quarter acre lot with like 20 geese. And they're mobbed up and they're rotated around doing the same thing we're doing, but on a very small scale. Yeah. yeah just, maybe, for, maybe for the sake of time, maybe just two more questions. Okay. Good. Back up the time. Let's go. Ben. So you're clearly a flaming liberal shrouded in flannel. <laughs> <laughs> nice work on that. How would you recommend dealing with these different government type folk and getting yourself included or not? <laughs> no, 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 no. Getting effectively through the programs, which does take a lot of what I would call patience, persistence. Yes. Well, you just, that's what I would say. What, what, yeah, so how so, do you do it? You, well, my only real uh, experience is with NRCS, uh, and it's been worth it because they're paying me to do big things that I want to do anyway, so I'm very motivated to have the patience. But really, it's finding the right language, finding the right words. Um, like I said, I don't talk about climate change with my neighbors, uh, and... I don't talk, I don't say a word like permaculture to my NRCS guy. Like, what? Um, so, I, and I won't make, wouldn't even say the word swale, maybe I'd say something like a diversion niche or something. Um, because everybody's got their own lexicon, everybody's coming from their own perspective, and it only makes sense to try to take that into consideration when you're talking to them, whether they're a government agent or a neighbor or, you know, your in laws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One thing I can add, add to about that, they, they have a working group every summer that comes around for the NRCS, and you go to that working group and you uh, tell them this story and everything, and if, you're, uh, if you can come up with the practices that are going to change things, like uh, the fencing help and the, and the, uh, the control of, of uh, weeds on the property so you can actually do, uh, do rotational grazing on your property. Uh, you can build a system that they can then uh, start to manufacture, but it has to be from the grassroots, from the community pushing us to do that. That's how we got a lot of these other changes you were just talking about here. Did they change that? Yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah. So that's, that's how great. it's done. Yeah. Thank you for your pioneer work. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.